uh, about this subject. And before you kind of switch off and say, oh, research, what a dull subject. That's really for academics to write papers. Let's actually have a quick snooze. Um, I'd like to wake you up a little bit um, <clears throat> and say that actually research is not about writing papers. It's about discovering insights that allow us to do healthcare better. Now, I've taken these bullet points as examples from Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser Permanente is a very integrated environment in the US where they have primary and secondary services all harmonized and where they actually have the ability to affect change. So what I want you to see is these are not research results. This slide is not telling you what were the insights. This slide is telling you when you use your data to develop insights and you use those insights to transform how you deliver care, what happens to the patients? What happens to the real humans? The answer is sometimes they don't die. This is serious, high impact, societally relevant learning from data. So please switch into that mentality rather than academics writing papers, although, of course, academics do have to write papers. Why is it so important that we learn from our data? <clears throat> because actually, we have a lot of knowledge gaps. This chart is just showing you <clears throat> that as we age, and I'm doing so, and I'm on this chart somewhere, you start to collect diseases. And the reason you collect them is because the first one doesn't kill you anymore. Thanks to advances, you, you live on and get the second and the third and the fourth. And our problem is nearly all of our scientific knowledge comes from single disease silos. That is, we have clinical guidelines in single diseases. Our drugs are developed through clinical studies looking at single diseases. So most of what we know about how to deliver good care is learned from single diseases. <clears throat> but that is not what Europe looks like today. We have a lot of learning to do. The other thing is we have a lot of learning to do from each other. There's a lot of fine print. You can't read the fine print from the back and because it's quite a wide room. I'm not terribly sure how well you can read the fine print from the sides of this auditorium. But you don't have to read. You just have to notice there are bunches of orange bars not of the same length. And that means that different countries are having different successes with how they look after patients with heart failure. So we have an obligation not only to learn from our data, but to share our learning, to learn from each other and improve practice. So that is the spirit with which I want you to think about health data. It's an obligation for us to say, how are you achieving better outcomes than me? What are you doing right that I'm not doing? And it takes a humility, of course, but it takes a spirit of sharing and learning together from our data. This is the cycle. This is from Chuck Friedman, the, perhaps the grandfather. I think he wouldn't be offended if I, he's older than me. I, he wouldn't mind being called a grandfather, I think, of the learning health system. It's an international movement. Our institute is part of that movement. It's about working together on a cycle where we learn from our data. We do things differently. The data, therefore, changes because it now reflects a different way of delivering care. And so from the new data, we learn again whether we've got things right or not right. And so the concept of research in this ecosystem is not limited to any one of those many granularities that exist, whether it's learning about small numbers of patients that allows a single care provider to be a bit smarter in how they deliver care, or whether it's looking at multi-millions of patients in order to develop a new drug, optimize an algorithm. It doesn't matter. They're all important. They all have value. And we need to mutually respect all of the actors in the landscape who are in the learning ecosystem. They're all contributing. Sometimes a discovery can be implemented as a change within months within a single care organization, 
or a group of patients who get given an app to allow them to do something more autonomously in a great way. Or it can be 15 years to develop a brand new drug for a disease that's proving to be a real issue for a set of po patients with the disease. The timing, the geographical distribution of the knowledge is not important. What matters is the spirit of always looking to learn from our data. So when we speak as an institute with our healthcare providers, what do we hear? They are, as an example, a hospital, but it isn't only a hospital. What are they wanting to see as their ambition? They want to see that rather than getting paid for physical activity, that the payment model, the reimbursement model, the reward model, the recognition model, the value model for an organization is about the impact they've had on real people. They want to use their knowledge to optimize care pathways to get the best outcomes, but mindful of the resource implications. How can they be efficient and yet deliver better care? Can they be more integrated? There's a real hunger. No, that's the wrong word. Frustration. There's a real pain and suffering in healthcare providers about the lack of ability to integrate, to connect. These multiple chronic diseases mean that we need to link primary and secondary care, link specialties, connect to social care, connect to patients and bring them in. Great frustration at that. They want to be on a learning and improving cycle. And when we get hospitals outside of their competitive space. You bring them at a European level together where they're surrounded by peers who are not an immediate neighbor of theirs. They're really open to learning and sharing their problems and their issues. They do want to be more research active. They see the spirit and culture of learning right across the research spectrum as being a healthy culture in their organizations. And they really do want to share good practice. Now, you can't do any of that unless you have a good EHR that contains reusable data. And by EHR, I don't mean the silo in one organization. I mean the patient-centric universe of knowledge about what's happening to a patient's health and health care. That is the EHR I'm talking about. Then you jump quickly to the scientific dimension, and I won't build all these points, and I'm not going to go through them all. But if you look just as an example at life sciences and medicines development, what would you do, colleagues in that sector, if you had better access to data? And here is a short list of a long list of possibilities that their eyes are open to. Many, many things. And I don't think you would look at that list and say, that's terrible. I don't want any of those things to happen. These are things that lead to better medicines, better devices, maybe better algorithms in the future, ways of improving the way we deliver care. These are great things. Critical success factor, high quality reusable EHR data. You get my punchline, don't you? So what are we trying to do about that? So I'm going to give you just two little brief windows at a European level. One is a project that I had the privilege of leading called EHR for CR. It's finished. It's done and dusted. Um, what it did was to look at how can we connect a set of hospitals, it was working with hospitals at that time, and analyze the data in those hospitals in order to find out what patients might be most suitable to a clinical trial that's in design. So firstly, if you discover what kind of patients exist, you can design the trial better so it's much more likely to recruit and be effective and be fast and get a successful drug out to the real world more quickly. It's about accelerating innovations in treatment. But also it avoids a lot of wastage because you end up otherwise taking a long time to do a trial and that adds to the cost of the drug, which makes it less affordable to health systems. So there are some really good benefits with this. And what we did was we developed an environment that would work for this purpose. So if you take in that dotted line um, uh, an imaginary hospital which has its EHR, you export the data into a separate clinical data warehouse which is just the minimal data you need for this purpose, anonymous data, and you connect only that to a central platform that runs queries. And that central platform <coughs> 
helps a researcher to be able to find out about the distribution of patients without any identifiers. They only get aggregate patient counts. It tells them how many people in this hospital could be eligible to your trial if you design it the way you're planning. Okay, not enough. All right, tweak your design, change your criteria slightly, <clears throat> and what happens? The numbers go up. You keep iterating until you know you've got a viable trial, and then you can run it. Robust security, this was designed, this whole architecture was designed pre-GDPR, but we knew it was coming, and it's fully GDPR compliant. So a person doing research can then externally to the environment can run better trials. But that last little arrow that I built is a different message. There is therefore also a tool for a hospital use to allow it to understand its own data. And we are just starting now to see, because this is being rolled out commercially, we are starting to see some hospitals starting to use the tool to do their own internal research in order to help either improve care or to advance <coughs> academic research at a very, very low cost. So this really helps to accelerate our learning right across the ecosystem. Um, as an example, a, research, a researcher composing a trial or a study would have a screen that allows them to author some eligibility criteria. This is a set of diabetes criteria. Doesn't matter what they are, they can hit run and they can get back a kind of spread of how many places across Europe that are connected might have the relevant patients and, and they can fine tune and iterate that. In case you ask, before we got too far on the design, we ran some really extensive studies across Europe, consulting with ethics committees, consulting with patient organizations to find out would this be acceptable? This is just one chart of many, but I hope you can read enough to see that when it's done in a GDPR compliant, aggregate data only way, patients are positive about this kind of way of improving and accelerating research. Now let's look at big data for a minute. <clears throat> if you go to the big data story, this is just an example of four bullet points, four simple examples of discoveries you can make when you're looking at a million or more patients. Because you can then start to narrow down your field to look for unusual things that in a database of a thousand people, you might not have one or you might have one. You can't tell if it's a pattern. Until you have enough, you can't determine if there's a pattern here. When you go plus to a, a beyond a million, you can start to make some really important discoveries. Now, these are not immediately transforming a person's life, but they are unlocking an opportunity to discover how to advance the practice of medicine or therapeutics so that we can, in the future, do that. This is a European project, just on one slide, called Eden. It's a about a year into a five-year program, and they are out looking for healthcare provider organizations that want to connect. Rather like the previous diagram, this is all about building an architecture that looks after privacy robustly. This is a complete GDPR landscape, fully compliant. And what happens is researchers are able to run queries on aggregate data, and the network they want to, they would love to have a hundred or more sites across Europe, maybe more than that. And there is a budget to connect to those sites. The sites get a budget to help them hand-holding with connecting. So if any of you are sitting in the driving seat of a healthcare provider organization, probably at this stage, the scale that's needed is a hospital. Apologies to GP colleagues in the audience. Um, if you're sitting there saying, hey, we could connect to something like that, we'd be interested in being part of a party of shared experiences, shared learning. Eden is the key word to look for. I'm sure if you Google it, it's unique. <coughs> I'd also like to turn attention to nations. This is only one slide of an example. 
in Germany, there is an ambitious program that's now also about a year in to say, can we grow the capability within a country to be more learning health system orientated? So there are four regional epicenters. I say epicenters because it's not one site. It's a cluster of sites at a regional level that have each taken some disease areas and said, how can we organize it so the EHRs collect data, even if they're different systems, collect data in a more standardized way that we have legitimate, compl- I mean, Germany is not a pushover for GDPR, as you can guess, nor is Ireland, by the way. Um, you know, how can we pool the analysis data in order to learn things and translate that back? So four learning health system ecosystems in Germany. There are other countries, I haven't got another dozen slides with other countries, but there are similar slides for many other countries. It's sometimes easier to proceed nationally than internationally to get buy-in, to get comfort. So it's a really important opportunity also when developing a national EHR to plug in a learning health system ecosystem so that you actually make sure you build in from the ground up continuous learning cycles. So where are we? We are at a stage where, excitingly enough, the data appetite, the need to learn from clinical research and healthcare are converging. We actually all, and I'm not going to speak to all these points. I'd love to read out all those bullet points because they're a bit small, but I can't do that in the time Derek's given me. Um, I'll have to be a bit mindful of that. So I want you to just realize that if you bring these worlds together, and that's one of our ambitions as an institute, if you bring them together, they reach a really powerful critical mass to affect change. We can't have silos of research and silos of care come together, share all of the momentum, all of the capability to make the data really deliver. So we work and we would commend any program to bring together the actors who somewhere touch the learning health ecosystem and go into co-creation mode. Bring everyone together, work together in order to visualize the capture and sharing of better quality health data, and then its trustworthy use and reuse for smarter healthcare and efficient research. We are working on a few particular stumbling blocks. What makes it hard to achieve that today? One of those, as you know, is interoperability. There are lots of technical interoperability standards. If you look at this slide and look at the right-hand side of this slide, we do it very well. We at an international level, produce lots of technical standards. We are absolutely terrible at the left-hand side of this slide. We do not bring the stakeholders together to say, what do we want to prioritize? How do we want to shape clinical data so it's meaningful and useful to us? And there are four actor categories on the left-hand side of this slide. And you will find clinician involvement is reasonable. Public health involvement is a little. Research involvement has its own silo of standards. Patient involvement is zero. It is zero globally. Terrible, isn't it? What good is it being able to share the data if the quality is not good enough? One of the big challenges with reusing health data is that it's a bit scrappy. It's a bit sporadic. People are entering data. So we've done a lot of work to say, what are the qualities of data that make its use trustworthy? And can we help, as an example, a hospital to understand its own data quality? So this is a very beautiful slide. I'm not planning to talk you through all these lovely images. Just imagine, though, just take the radius diagram. If you knew from a set of quality indicators where your hospital was and where you were weak, we can start to think, what are your systematic errors? Does it lie in your EHR system, not really meeting the needs of today? Or does it lie in the culture of data entry? Does it rely on, does it lean on other things that the hospital is not doing right to help make it work? So it's really important that we look after that topic. Just in my last minute, one minute, I'd like to also invite you to take a look at this URL, and I think the slides will be available later. 
Connected Health Cities has done some really nice work in the north of England looking at how can the public be brought on board with everything I've just been saying about really championing the use of data, not reluctantly saying, oh, yeah, you can use my data. No, get on with it. Get on and do these great things with the data. That's what we need to hear. We need to be deafened by the sound. Get on with it. And so this is a fantastic piece of work to help look at what are the things the public most care about as acceptance criteria. And I'd like to now close by saying we are part of Data Saves Lives. You've seen from, from the slide that was flashing up on the background when Derek was on stage and that lovely, nice, long thing that people are carrying around the room. Data Saves Lives is, is an initiative uh, in which Hiposi is a strong player along with us to try to help the public understand effectively what I've been saying in this talk because we want them to understand why and how it's important to use data wisely and well and how it can be done in trustworthy GDPR compliant ways. So really I feel this audience has tremendous power. Uh, I understand a really high percentage of patient representatives in this room. You are our positive disruptive influence, bottom up. Get on with it please. Help us all to get on with making good use of data. Thank you. Thank you.